So our passage this morning is Mark chapter 5, and we'll be looking at the first 20 verses of that chapter. Mark chapter 5. And as you turn to that, I will just let you know that my colleague, Ian Smith, who is based at Oxford, is here. We are part of a ministry called Ravi Zacharias International Ministries. And um, my friend, Joe Mushekeh, and his wife, Mary, are also here. And they are also partners with, that, with us in that ministry. Joe is one known here as well. Maybe you can stand and wave, both of you. Uh, actually, the three of you. I Ian Smith, and then Joe and his wife. I have many other friends uh, in the audience. If I were to uh, call everybody, we would all stand and wave, which would not make much sense. So I hope you are there, Mark chapter 5. Let me introduce this book first before we go too far and tell you what it's about, what Mark was writing about, and why we need to take this gospel very, very seriously. You remember Mark as one of the traveling partners of the Apostle Paul, and Paul and Barnabas in the beginning. You also remember that he abandoned Paul, and this caused a sharp dispute between Paul and Barnabas. Paul went one way, and Barnabas took John Mark and went a different way. But Mark was later reconciled with Paul, and they became traveling companions once again. Uh, when you read the Gospel of Mark, there are several things that stand out. We cannot be able to mention all of them this morning, so I just want to mention a few that relate to the message that um, the Lord has for us this morning. And the first one I want to mention is this. Mark was not writing to a Jewish audience. He was writing to the Romans who didn't quite understand Jewish custom. And how do we know that? Because he explains things that relate to the Jews that non-Jewish people would not be able to understand. For example, in Mark chapter 7, he writes this. The Pharisees and some teachers of the law who had come from Jerusalem gathered around Jesus and saw some of, the, some of his disciples eating food with hands that were unclean, that is, unwashed. So explain what unclean means. And then he says, the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they give their hands a ceremonial washing, holding to the tradition of the elders. When they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash and they observe many other traditions, and just, just goes on to explain these customs that Jewish were used to. And he would not need to explain those if he was writing to a Jewish audience. So he was writing to the Romans who needed to understand what this was about. The second thing that we see in this book is that there is a sense of great urgency as Mark is writing this. He uses the word immediately, immediately, over and over again. So there is something that he wants to make sure that we don't miss. When you're reading this book, he wants to make sure that you don't miss the point that he is trying to make. And then in chapter 10 and verse 45, he summarizes his message. He tells us what the whole book is about. That's the key verse for the, for the Gospel of Mark. And this is what it says. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. That's, who, uh, that's what the book is about, the Son of Man. Now, if you were to read the writings of some liberal scholars, they would tell you that when Jesus calls himself the Son of Man, what he is trying to do is to make sure that we understand that he was a mere human being. He was just a human being, and it, it took a long time for Christology or the nature of Christ to be elevated to the point where we began to think that he was God. Because when, by the time you get to the Gospel of John, he's being referred to as the Son of God, not the Son of Man. And so they will tell you the reason that happened is the Gospel of Mark was written first, and then many, many years passed, and at the end, by, by the 90s, 60 years after Jesus, people had come to elevate Jesus to the point where they now considered him to be God, and that's why he's referred to as the Son of God. That's a serious misreading of Scripture because the title, Son of Man, is the highest way in which Jesus could have claimed to be 
a divine being, to be God in human flesh, is by using that title, Son of Man. And how do we know that? In Mark chapter 14, from verse 61 to verse 64, during the trial of Jesus, we have this fascinating exchange between Jesus and the high priest. It says this in verse 61 of Mark chapter 14, but Jesus remained silent and gave no answer. Again, the high priest asked him, are you the Messiah, the son of the blessed one? Verse, four, verse 62, I am, said Jesus, and you will see the son of man, there goes the title again, sitting at the right hand of the mighty one and coming on the clouds of heaven. The high priest tore his clothes. Why do we need any more witnesses, he asked. You have heard the blasphemy. What do you think? They all condemned him as worthy of death. But wait a minute. He just referred to himself as the son of man, and if he's just trying to prove that he's a mere human being, why this reaction from the high priest and those with him? Why did they react the way they did? Here is the reason. Jesus takes three passages from the Old Testament that refer to Jehovah God, and he places those upon himself, and he says, these passages actually refer to me, and that's why we get this reaction here. So what are those passages? First of all, by saying, I am, that's from Exodus 3, verse 14, where God tells Moses that his name, God's name, is I am who I am. And then you see, The, the next phrase that we see is the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven. That, that comes from Daniel chapter 7 from, the, from verse 13 to verse 14. That's why you get the phrase, the Son of Man, and that's a divine being coming from heaven. And Jesus says that this actually refers to me. And then he says the other phrase, sitting at the right hand of God. That's from Psalm 110, which is also a phrase that is used for a being that King David worshipped. This is the living God. And Jesus takes those passages and applies them to himself. And the Jewish people who were listening to him understood who these passages refer to in the Old Testament. And so when Jesus answers the question this way, they cannot stand it and they condemn him to death. So here is what Mark is saying. He is writing to a Roman audience people who are not taken to be members of the people of God, he's writing to them, and he is writing with a lot of urgency and telling them that God himself, the God who made this world, has a message for you. And that's why this book is so, so significant and so important. And in our passage, we can now come to a passage, Mark chapter 5, he applies that message in a powerful way powerful way. And so I have entitled our message this morning, Alienation and Restoration, the Human Soul in Search of Its Identity. Alienation and Restoration, the Human Soul in Search of Its Identity. In Mark chapter 4, just before this passage, Jesus calms the storm. He is sovereign over what is seen, over the physical. In our passage, he deals with the demonic realm. He is sovereign over, over the unseen as well. Everything answers to his name because he made it. He is God. He is sovereign. But we see one area in which God's plan hasn't gone the way he intended it to go. And that's the realm in which you and I live, and that's what made it necessary for Jesus to come to correct our capacity to relate to one another and to God as well, because all of our problems as human beings in this world can be summed up in one word, alienation. We are separated, we are out of fellowship in one way or another, and Jesus came to restore that capacity that we have to be able to relate properly. Now, there's something else that we need to do before we even go deeper into the text, and that is to address some ideas that might, might be in your mind that can easily keep you from appreciating 
what this passage has to do and how it applies in your life. One of those ideas is the view or, or, or the sense that this passage is not for you because it talks about a man who was living in the tombs who was demonic and all that. And so you read that and you think that was happening many, many years ago. But in our day, especially as we are becoming more affluent, this is happening uh, in Nairobi, I think, because in places where uh, I, I, I work, in many parts of this country, there are still people in our country who are suffering a lot. But the more we, de we develop, the more God blesses us. This is what usually ends up happening. We imbibe a type of education that takes us away from understanding what God has given us, and we begin to call ourselves sophisticated, and so we cannot be able to deal with these kinds of uh, teachings anymore because today we understand what was happening. They didn't have the risk, they had not done the research and the knowledge that we have today to understand that these mental illnesses can actually be classified in certain ways and actually treated in certain ways. We know there's such a thing as um, chemical imbalance, schizophrenia, multiple personalities, all these things happening. And so we have psychological explanations for these problems. This is not for us today. If that's your thinking, you have a very hard time understanding what is happening in this passage. And that thinking would be wrong because even in those days, they still understand the differences in the types of illnesses that we deal with in this world. For example, in Mark chapter 4 and verse, verse 24, it says this, News about Jesus spread all over Syria, and people brought to him all who were ill with various diseases, those suffering severe pain, the demon possessed, those having seizures, and the paralyzed, and he healed them all. So just because somebody was having a seizure, they didn't run to the conclusion that this person was demon-possessed. They understood those differences uh, uh, just like we do today. But you might also think, because this passage talks about the demoniac who was living among the tombs, that this is not relevant to me because I don't have that level of demonic oppression in my life. That is another mistake that we can make over and over again and end up missing the message that God is giving to us. C.S. Lewis wrote the following, there are two equal and opposite errors into which our race can fall about the devils. One is to disbelieve in their existence, that's one error, and the other is to believe and to feel an excessive and unhealthy interest in them. They themselves are equally pleased by both errors and hail a materialist or a magician with the same delight. So if you say they don't exist, they're very happy. They will encourage you to go that way because they can use you. If you want to be obsessed with them, they will encourage you as well because they can use that as well. Either extreme will land you into trouble. Another reason why this passage is so relevant to us today is because we are all susceptible to the influence of the evil one. There is no human being who is exempt. The devil is always looking for a way to put you where you shouldn't be, and that is true of every human being in this world. There is an unfortunate translation in our Bible where, when it talks about demon possession. That phrase possession is actually not there in the original. The word is daimonismai in Greek, and it actually means to be demonized or to be influenced by demons, and that can happen to anybody, whether you are Christian or not. You are never going to be possessed, owned by the devil, if you belong to God. So we shouldn't even be talking about demon, demon possession in this context, because what the Bible is teaching us is that there is an evil one out there who is looking for a way to put you down and to take you aside from what God has called you to be, regardless of your station in life and regardless of your theological confession. And so this story it applies to each one of us. We do have a powerful enemy, and we cannot afford to play around uh, uh, with him. Now that we are finished with the introduction, let's go to the message. I say that all the problems that plague humanity can be summed up in one word, alienation. And the solution can also be summed up in one word, and that is restoration. Alienation and restoration as we look for our identity. The reason for that is this. 
we were all created for relationships. All human beings were created for relationships. They have done some crazy experiments in this world, and one of those was where they took newborn babies and put them in a nursery and provided everything the babies needed except just physical touch and talking to the children. They gave them everything else, food, they kept, they kept, them, kept them clean and everything. Do you know what happened to those children? They died just because of lack of touch. We were all created for relationships, and yet we live lives that are separated from those relationships, and our relationships are messed up in big ways, and Jesus came to correct that. So let's look at how this plays out in the life of this man. The first thing we see is that this man is, that this man is alienated from God. That is theological alienation. He is alienated from God. He is not a member of what is called the people of God because he is living in a place where there are many people who are raising pigs. And maybe I should, I'll, I'll just read a, a few verses so that we can uh, refresh your memory and so you can have the context better in mind uh, from chapter 5 from verse 1 of the Gospel of Mark. They went across the lake to the region of the Gerasenes. When Jesus got out of the boat, a man with an evil spirit came from the tombs to meet him. This man lived in the tombs, and no one could bind him anymore, not even with a chain. For he had often been chained hand and foot, but he tore those chains apart and broke the arms on his feet. No one was strong enough to subdue him. Night and day among the tombs and in the hills, he would cry out and cut himself with stones. When he saw Jesus from a distance, he ran and fell on his knees in front of him. He shouted at the top of his voice, What do you want with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? Swear to God that you will not torture me. For Jesus had said to him, Come out of this man, you evil spirit. Then Jesus asked him, What is your name? My name is Legion, he replied, for we are many. And he begged Jesus again and again not to send them out of the area. A large herd of pigs was feeding on the nearby hillside. The demons begged Jesus, send us among the pigs and allow us to go into them. He gave them permission, and the evil spirits came out and went into the pigs. The herd, about 2,000 in number, rushed down the steep bank into the lake and were drowned. Those tending the pigs ran off and reported this in the town and countryside, and the people went out to see what had happened. When they came to Jesus, they saw the man who had been possessed by the legion of demons sitting there, dressed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. This man is separated or alienated from God. So he is living in a Gentile territory, and we know that because he's in an area where they raise a lot of pigs. The Jews would never do that. They would never raise pigs at all because they were detestable to them for many historical reasons, not just because they were forbidden in the book of, Levit of Leviticus. So he's alienated from God, and he is inhabited by demons. So he's as far from God as you can get. He was also alienated from others. It wasn't just the theological alienation from God. He was also alienated socially from other people. And we read, this, we read these desperate words in this passage, no one could tame him anymore. They speak of him the way you would speak of an animal, that they were actually trying to tame him. And what they would do, there are people who cared for him, they would buy the strongest, the strongest chains they could find and to try, try to tie him up to keep him in one place. But he was so strong that he broke those chains apart and preferred to go and live out in the tombs. And people were scared of going in that direction. If this was a member of your family, he, is not, he would not be a part of the dinner conversation when guests came to visit. You prefer not to talk about him because he was a source of shame, a source of disgrace, and they were probably just waiting for the time that he would die and they would go to those hills and collect his remains and bury him because he was a source of great, um, a great disgrace and shame to this family. He was alienated from others and... Lastly, he was alienated from himself. That is a psychological alienation, alienated from himself. The Bible says that this man was cutting himself with stones, that he was on a path of self 
destruction. And this is what our alienation in our relationships end up doing to us. We end up destroying ourselves. And this is exactly what this man was doing. Theological, social, and psychological alienation. And the result is a loss of identity. You don't know who you are anymore. When you begin to live like this, you end up so many miles away from where God wanted you to be that you can end up looking like a person who has everything together and yet you are miles away from what God intended for you to be. Descartes said a long time ago, I think, therefore I am. But with our obsession with the impersonal or social media platforms that further compound our identity by encouraging us to project a false image of who we are, our motto has become, I post, therefore I am. And that's how we live and that's how we think. You probably heard of the two Australian brothers who got drunk at a pub in London and uh, they couldn't find, they got out, they were so misty they could not tell where they were. They saw this man walking towards them. He was a highly decorated military officer in full uniform. And one of the brothers says, says to him, uh, can you, hey, can you tell us where we are? And the man was not used to being addressed that way, especially when he was in full uniform. He was very offended. He said to him, he said to them, do you men know who I am? And the brother said to his, to his brother and said to him, we are in more trouble than I thought. We don't know where we are, and he doesn't know who he is. <laughs> That's the way we live today. Do you know that in New York City today, there are 31 different genders, not just male and female, but 31 different genders recognized in the U.S. today, in the U.S., in New York City today. We have a lot of confusion in our time about who we are as human beings. Sometimes we, class, we classify people, you belong to a certain class, and so you are more important than somebody from a lower class. We think that happens only in India. It happens here too, it happens in many parts of the world where we have really began, began to lose our identity and who we are. And so we get to the point where we have all kinds of problems, all kinds of trouble in our schools because our children don't know who they are anymore, and we are wondering what to do with them. Do we bring back the chains and tie them up, like these men were doing to this man here? There are people who are advocating that we bring back caning, we begin, we begin uh, beating up our children again, until we realize that it will take a change of heart and a confidence in who we are in God. We are going to be very, very far from solving the problem that we're dealing with. We never talk, we don't, we, were told we, we don't talk about millions anymore in Kenya, we talk about billions. And even in our corruption scandals, we don't talk about millions anymore, we talk about billions. Serious, serious issue that we are having to deal with. So what is the answer to this alienation? What's the answer? The answer is not going to be learning more theology or even Bible study and all those kinds of things. Those are good things. The Bible values knowledge. And the Bible says, my people perish due to lack of knowledge. And the Bible says that zeal without knowledge is not going to be helpful. But understanding what the Bible teaches and being able to wow people by how well you can present it and being able to wow people by how well you can lead worship and all that is really not going to do it. And we have the evidence right here. At the end of Mark chapter 4, after Jesus calms the storm, the disciples look at him and say, who in the world is this? They don't understand who Jesus is. And yet here, when the demons see Jesus coming, they recognize him immediately for who he is. And we are told elsewhere that they say to him, are you going to torture us before our time? Their theology is really good. It's actually better than yours and mine. They understand these, these issues very well. They understood that the destruction of evil and the judgment against demons was not going to happen during the first coming of Jesus. And so they said to him, are you going to torture us before our time? We still have some time left. That will happen during your second coming. They understood that very well. So we can be able to understand Christian theology and still fall prey to the wiles of the evil one if we are not careful to have 
that relationship with God restored to the extent that we can be able to know God for who he is, know ourselves for who we are. If we don't do that, we set ourselves up for failure. And where does this restoration begin? It begins right there where we know who we are and we know who God is. Jesus looks at this man and he says to him, he asks him a question, what is your name? And in his book, Can Man Live Without God, Ravi points out that the connection between uh, what is going on here and what is going on in the book of Genesis is truly amazing. It's not possible to hear that question, what is your name, if you know your Bible very well, without hearing the exact same question asked of Jacob in the book of Genesis. Jacob had stolen his brother's blessing and he had ran away and now he is coming back. He's extremely wealthy and for the very first time he is thinking and worried about someone else, not himself. Because he is terrified of meeting his brother Esau as he's coming back home because he thinks Esau has prepared, preparing all these years to eliminate Jacob's family. And so as he is planning and strategizing on what to do, one night somebody appears and wrestles with Joseph, with Jacob until morning, and Jacob himself tells us that it was actually God who was wrestling with him. In the morning, Jacob says to him, I am not going to let you go until you bless me. Do you see what is happening? The man asks Joseph, I mean Jacob, what is your name? If I say Joseph, I mean Jacob. Okay. What is your name? Do you see what is happening? Many, many years before, Jacob was standing before his blind father who could not see. And his father asked him, who are you? And what did he say? I am Esau. He was looking for a blessing. He said, I am Esau. And he stole the blessing. Now, it's many years later, he is standing before an all-knowing God, and he is looking for a blessing. And he asks, he is asked, what is your name? And you know what he thinks? I've been found. <laughs> Leon me Patikana. Because he is before an all-knowing God, so he cannot lie. What does he say? I am Jacob. And God says, now that you recognize who you are, you know who you are, you are ready for the restoration of my relationship with you. And God changes his name to Israel. What is your name? Jesus is asking you and me the same question. What is your name? And some people that I've been talking to in this country will tell me they're atheists, they don't believe in God. You are on your own. You know why? Because the devil who's encouraging you to do that understands these issues much better than you do. Do you know that once you begin to understand who you are and you understand who God is, that that puts you on a course that can have you literally changing the world because it will change your life and make you into a kind of person that other people cannot be able to explain or understand. Our rights our identity, who we really are, doesn't come from the position we hold, from the money we have, from the power we wield, doesn't come from any of that. It comes from a knowledge of who we are in Christ. It is God who defines us. And our rights as human beings do not come from the government, from anywhere else. They come from the God who made us. The value that God places on each individual human soul is incomprehensible to us. G.K. Chesterton uh, said this. He was a, a, a British um, journalist and author with amazing books. He says this, that the most difficult doctrine to understand in the scriptures is not the Trinity or the virgin birth or how Jesus could be both God and man. He says those are easier compared to this one doctrine. And what's that? The value that God places on each individual 
human soul. And when you look at it, you will see that that is really true. Because in Genesis 1.27, the Bible says that we were made in the image of God. Psalm 8, David asks the question, what is man that you are mindful of him? And then he answers the question that he asks, and he says this, you made him a little lower than my trans trans translation says the angels, but in the original it actually says, you made him a little lower than Elohim, than God. And once you begin to understand what the Bible is saying, it actually sounds like blasphemy coming out of your lips. But this is the word of God. Romans 8.29, the Bible says, The reason you and I were saved is so that we can become conformed to the image of God's Son, to become like Christ. 2 Peter 1.4, that we are partakers of the divine nature. Revelations 22 and verse 5, we will reign with him forever and ever. The value God places on each individual human being is so great that a deranged lunatic out there in the field is worth a lot more than 2,000 pigs. Jesus doesn't even give a thought to it when they ask, can we go to the pigs instead? Yes, go into the pigs because the value of that one person, the value of this one disabled child that we are being displayed here is infinite in God's sight because we were all made in the image of God. And Jesus did this. Jesus solved this problem of our broken relationships and our inability to relate to each other well. Jesus solves that, that by taking our place as a ransom for many, as a ransom for many to rescue you and to rescue me. When this gospel comes to the end, we have Jesus himself looking like this deranged um, lunatic. How is that? You have Jesus with blood all over him crying out in agony. You also see Jesus hung, hanging outside the city walls, naked, just like this man was out there in the field. And in the end, his body is placed in a tomb. He took our nakedness. He took our shame. He took our guilt. He died in our place. And he welcomes each one of us to bring all that brokenness before him so that we can be what he originally meant for each one of us to be. If we are not careful that we, to know that we do have an enemy who is pulling us in the opposite direction from where God wants us to go, we set ourselves up for great failure. But he who is in us is greater than he that is in the world. We can be dressed. We can sit there dressed and in our right mind. You might read that, this, that this, when the villagers came, they found this man dressed and in his right mind and think, or oh, they're just talking about the fact that he was roaming about among the tombs without clothes. It's much deeper than that. This idea of being dressed, being clothed, harkens back to Genesis, where, which is our condition, which is what happened to Adam and Eve when they disobeyed God. They realized that they were naked. And the only, you and, well, the only way you and I can be able to stand faultless before the cross of Jesus Christ is when we are clothed in his righteousness alone. And it is all offered freely to all of us. All offered freely to all of us. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you so much for the power and beauty of your word. We thank you that it reaches to the depths of our beings. We thank you, Lord, that there is no human being who is exempt from the grace of God, who is too low for you to reach them. We thank you, Lord, for your truth. We thank you for this church. I pray that your name will uh, continue to be glorified, to be honored in even greater ways. The plans that have been put in place here, that, Lord, they will continue to flourish into fruition and that uh, the power of God will reign supreme here. We 
we want to cancel any powers of the evil one, anything that he may have over this church, we want to pray, Lord, that you will intervene and that, Lord, you will rescue your people and that you will help all of us to be committed to you and to realize, Lord, that we cannot continue playing around with the enemy of our souls. We thank you that he who is in us is greater than he that is in the world and that you are always stand ready to forgive us and to rescue us, however bad our situation may be. We thank you, we praise you, we honor you, and even as we dedicate this entire week to you, I pray that you bless your people as we go out of here today. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.